Hi, I'm David Zachariah, and I'll be giving a talk that links purchasing power to class polarization. And the context, of course, is the ongoing cost of living crisis experienced across the world. It is experienced primarily through a steep increase in the price of goods and services. For instance, let's consider a basket B of diverse goods and services. It may include a liter of petrol, a packet of milk, or a haircut. Now, if the total price of this basket was about $1,000 last year, it is $1,090 today. And this, of course, is experienced as a squeeze on the living standards of many working families. And furthermore, intensifies the conflict over the distribution of economic resources. Now, the claim in this talk is that workers' incomes must keep up with the rising prices, as well as the material productivity of a basket B. If they do not, then they will be receiving a declining amount of the collective labor that they supply to the economy. We will try to substantiate this in the slides to come. So, to study the real effects of inflation for the masses, we will need a different yardstick than price. Now, where do these ideas come from? They're not new. They go back to at least two centuries of work focused on labor exploitation and the economic conditions of the working classes. An early example is that of Hodgkin and his labor defended against the claims of capital. And a more famous example is, of course, Marx's Capital Volume 1. This talk is built on ideas found in the book Laws of Chaos by Emmanuel Fardun and Moshe Makover, and that's been further developed by us in a recent book called How Labor Powers the Global Economy. Okay, let's turn now to an alternative yardstick to price. specifically a yardstick that's anchored in the sphere of production because the basket of any collection of goods and services is ultimately a product of human labor. So let's consider the average amount of resources expended to produce our basket of goods and services. In this talk, we will focus on the amount of labor expended to produce the basket B labor being a rather special input. While crude oil and labor are both basic inputs, you can allocate labor to produce more crude oil, but you cannot allocate crude oil to produce more labor. Labor is therefore a universal and an ultimate input that sets it apart from all other resources expended in production. So our new yardstick is the labor content of a basket measured in worker hours, the average amount of labor expended to produce it. So a given basket of our milk, petrol, haircuts may have a labor content of about say 17 hours. Let us now build a bridge between labor content and price. Now the prices of each commodity product in our basket may vary from one transaction to the next. A packet of milk may cost differently from one shop to the next, and may even vary across days. Let us define the price rate of a bought and sold milk packet to be its price in dollars per worker hour of labor content. In our book, we call this the specific price of our milk packet. Now let's look at the whole economy and consider all labor content that's bought and sold, all the different goods and services that are purchased. Their price rates vary from one transaction to the next, but if we consider the entire collection of all price rates, then a conservative estimate would be that the bulk of the labor content has a price rate ranging from about $25 to $75 
per worker hour. Now let's consider a sample basket with diverse products that we fetch from different stores. Suppose we randomly go and purchase eight different items, then maybe our particular basket has a price rate of about $75, let's say. But as we increase the number of items in our sample basket, the price rate stabilizes around $60 per work hour. Why that number? It turns out that the price rate of any large sample basket is well approximated by the average wage rate in the economy, divided by the wage share. So let's take an example. What does this mean? In the US economy, the average wage rate is about $30 per hour. And the wage share in the total economy is about 50%. So if you purchase a large basket of products in the economy, it will fetch a price of approximately $60 per worker hour. The consequence, of course, is that the price of any lar large diverse basket B is roughly proportional to the to total labor content given by this formula. And so if you go to our example in the US economy, if you have a sum of $1,000, you can purchase a diverse basket of products whose labor content is about 16.7 worker hours or about 17 work hours. Now we have an alternative yardstick to price, labor content. And we can use this now to measure incomes. So let's turn to the purchasing powers of incomes. Obviously now a larger income enables you to purchase a greater amount of the labor content in the economy. So let's take a realistic example. The median weekly pay in the United States is about $1,000. And that gives you a purchasing power of about 17 working worker hours. A pay for about 40 hours of work. And so the remaining 23 hours are transferred to other agents. Now measuring incomes not in dollars, but instead in terms of labor content that you can purchase provides a different distributional measure than price. Let's now define the wage rates in terms of labor content that you can purchase. So let's take data from the United States. If you look at the minimum wage rate and compute the amount of labor that you can purchase for one hour of minimum wage, that's about 0.12 hours. What does this mean? It means if you work 100 hours under minimum wage, you can buy back about 12 hours of labor content. Similarly, for a fast food worker, if you work 100 hours, you get back about 20 hours. A registered nurse gets about 62 hours. By contrast, a chief executive gets about 144 hours back. This, of course, implies a net transfer of labor towards the upper classes. We can now consider all wage earners and the distribution of wage rates, which places the minimum wage, the, the registered nurse, and the chief executive in different places. We can see the chief executive belongs to this tail to the right, whereas the minimum wage and fast food worker are on the lower end as well. And this gives us a way to study wage inequality and the position of the worst paid half of labor. At the opposite end, you have people earning wage rents, which is by definition economically denied to the majority of workers. Wage earners that, are, that belong to this end receive a net transfer of labor from the rest. One property of this distribution is that its balancing point 
illustrated by the cross, determines the wage share of the economic output. How much of the economic output belongs to the workers. Now, this share is the share of a very large basket of diverse products. Consider, for instance, a economy with about 10 million workers producing this enormous basket. Then firms are extracting a labor content of about 18 billion worker hours. Now, if the wage share is about 50%, then the remaining 50%, about 9 billion worker hours, are appropriated by other agents, such as firms, frontiers, other non-workers. It's a transfer of labor from one group to, the, to another. Finally, let's look at how this leads to class polarization. We have seen that incomes lead to the appropriation of labor via wages or any other income such as property incomes, transfer and so on. And this basic fact divides the population into distinct class locations. Now the profit imperative to receive returns on your investments generates an insatiable need to extract labor content from workers. And it's this labor content that property owners are clashing and competing over. And it also gives rise to various forms of labor exploitation, what Marx called primary and secondary forms of exploitation. Now the question arises, what changes the purchasing power over labor for different groups? Well, we can set an upper limit that the purchasing power of any income group cannot grow faster than the workforce for any longer period of time. You can simply not appropriate more labor than there's labor added to the economy. Now there are three paths through which the purchasing power can change. The immediate one, of course, is the conflict over incomes. The more workers struggle to improve their wages, the distribution pushes upwards and the tip balancing point moves to the right, leading to a higher wage share. Conversely, as labor is degraded, the balancing point moves to the left and a larger labor content is appropriated by property owners like this. Another path is, of course, price inflation, which has skyrocketed the last year. This leads to an income growth for sellers of certain commodity products, such as oil companies who see a transfer of labor content. A third path is we argue a central dynamic force in capitalism, and it's the decreasing labor content of many baskets of goods and services. In fact, if you take a large diverse basket, its labor content tends to be cut in half every 25 years about. And for mass products such as consumer electronics, the rate is even faster. By contrast, many services have no declining labor content and remain labor intensive, such as teaching or haircuts. Now what can be shown that this trend of declining labor content is a consequence of widespread cost cutting by firms. It's an unintended consequence but it also puts downward pressure on the L wages, the amount of labor content that you can purchase. And moreover, it lowers the bottom floor of the distribution because it decreases the labor content for the minimum types of baskets needed for survival, basic food, medicine, housing. So all in all, the purchasing power over labor content 
changes via three rates. The struggle over income growth, price inflation, and the material productivity of baskets of products. For instance, if income grows by 6% for a certain group and inflation is about 2%, while productivity is 3%, then that group will increase their labor content by about 1%. And of course, this cannot exceed the growth of the workforce for very long, which is in the US economy now even below 1%. By contrast, let's assume that workers receive a nominal wage growth of about 2% per year, but inflation skyrockets to 9 and productivity is stagnant at about 1% per year. Then workers will be receiving a declining amount of labor content by 8% per year, which is a drastic decline. So let's wrap up with some conclusions. We have introduced labor content as a yardstick for incomes, a different way to measure the size of incomes across society. We looked at the ways to which the purchasing power over labor content can change through direct struggle, through price inflation, and indirectly through productivity gains. We have seen how this can result in growing inequality and class polarization. More details are spelled out in our recent book. The book considers a range of different inquiries. One is the limits to capitalist development. One limit that we identify arises from the drive toward exponential growth driven by the profit imperative that is now constrained by a stagnant workforce, as well as a shift towards labor-intensive services. And in the book, we argue that this raises the obstacles to improving human well-being under capitalism.